Okay, the audio is cracking a little bit on Zoom. Cool, Ho hopefully that gets better. Uh, okay, hello everybody. Super excited to be back with you guys for another episode of Grade School. I'm also really excited to be joined by Raphael today, who's going to help me co-host and moderate and uh, get everyone's questions answered. So uh, let's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have him as well. So we've got lots and lots of stuff uh, to cover today that I'm really excited to talk about. Um, I think Raphael is going to uh, be feeding me uh, some of our questions today. So what do we got first up, Raphael? Uh, the first question comes from actually me. And how does the thing photographically mentality live in the world of badly exposed shots, poor consistency and completely different cameras? I say this because I'm a filmmaker student and I usually offer my classmates to grade their projects for free just to get experience and it's a complete mess most of the time. Yeah, so it, it's such a good question that uh, I'm going to answer, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look at uh, some examples here and resolve. The think photographically concept, I, I, I think really does, it, it should occupy as much of our process and our thinking as it possibly can. Um, and I recognize that there are limits at which we really do need to start thinking more graphically and more in terms of like the, you know, kind of color correction model where it's like, hey, we got to do whatever we can to make this look good and making broad photographic and simpler uh, adjustments and manipulations isn't always enough. So, uh, you know, kind of to, to put it broadly, I would say when we run into those circumstances, like we have one allegiance that's even greater than thinking photographically. Thinking photographically is really, really important. But the, the, what's even more important than thinking photographically is you know we, we when we're grading material whether it's our own or somebody's somebody else's we take you know kind of the hippocratic oath if anybody's uh, familiar with that or the the hippocratic oath says first do no harm right so that's our rule when we're grading as well as first do no harm or to put it another way we need to make our images look better than when they came in we have to find a way to do that it usually works best with thinking photographically and with solving our problems that can be solved technically and mathematically in that way, as opposed to immediately resorting to our hands and our eyes. But ultimately, uh, there's no wrong way to deliver an image that looks better than where it came in. There's only more efficient and more pleasurable ways uh, to address those things. So uh, I actually, I, I thought I was gonna demo something, but I don't know if I have a great example of that per se, but that's how I would answer that. I, I would push that as far as I can. I would, you know, like the, something that I definitely have done in the past is especially when I'm live in session with clients or with collaborators and they ask for stuff and they, they want something that I'm like, gosh, I, I, I'm not going to be able to get there with an exposure knob or with a color temperature adjustment or, or, or what have you. I'll give it to them however I can in the room. If I got to pull a dirty qualifier or a power window or do something really narrow and tweaky that isn't my first choice, if it makes them happy, uh, I'm happy to do it and I'll do it that way. But I will often do a post game with myself after the fact and rethink and go, gosh, how could I have addressed that more cleanly, more photographically? And I can't really think of an instance that I haven't been able to come up with a better answer when I'm not in the heat of the moment. So over time, when those types of notes come up again, I hopefully have better ammunition and a more robust toolkit for dealing with those issues uh, when they come up and even when it's challenging my ability to work and think photographically. I feel like I, I, I've, my, my toolkit for dealing with that stuff has continued to expand over time and I can incorporate more and more of what I do and what I'm asked to do under that umbrella of thinking and working photographically. And I, I hope that that also addresses a question that I know that uh, Gadali had uh, a, a, as well that was kind of uh, along those same lines. So hopefully that uh, sort of uh, addresses both of those questions. Uh, at once. Yeah, hope, hope, hope that's helpful. Let's hear what's next. Jordan Ledbetter asks, when working with S-Log3, A7S3, and A6CCT, what do you recommend exposing at white filming? I know the highlights clip at 94 plus IRE, so I had previously been relying on zero set to this value, and then exposing just before clipping occurs. Will this work or do you recommend a plus zero exposure setting? 
Yeah, I remember getting this question this week, and I, I, I see Jordan's here with us today. I'm so glad. This is such a good question to ask. And I'll give my disclaimer up front that I'm not a cinematographer, and uh, there, there's no substitute for the, the rigor and the training that uh, you guys have when you are acquiring images. But I do have some good thoughts to add to that conversation. So to me, uh, we almost want to zoom out a little bit and ask a bigger, broader question uh, to really get at what I think uh, you're, you're trying to find, which is, what is the optimal way to use this instrument that's at my disposal? In this case, this imaging uh, device or this imaging sensor, which has uh, a particular set of processing that comes after it and gives me this S-log wide gamut image, probably S gamut 3 cine. And there's a lot of different ways to think about that. And there's some shorthand rules that we can use. But my first choice when I'm going through this, this is a, a good question because it leads to one of the things that I'm most passionate about, which is that there's no substitute for testing. You know, like you can look at, you'll find literature out there probably from Sony and even from other shooters about like how many stops above and below middle exposure at this uh, exposure rating are you going to get out of that sensor when capturing S-Log? And probably some of that stuff is gonna be accurate. Some of it may not be accurate. And that's why I feel there's really no substitute for testing yourself and shoot, you know, like a middle exposure at, you know, one stop over two, three, four, five, go all the way until you are getting clipping and then go uh, underexposed until you're getting clipping on the bottom end. And then from there, you would want to marry those tests or, or rather incorporate them into an image processing pipeline or a color management pipeline like we talked about with ACES or with Resolve Color Management if you're uh, up on that workflow and know that you're looking at a technically sound mapping, pull all that stuff in and what I would do from there is look at those bracketed exposure tests with the goal of exposing the overexposures back down and the underexposures back up to dead center and see where things are clipping out. See where uh, you want, uh, you, you know, like how many stops above and below middle gray are you getting out of that sensor before you lose that data completely. And from there, I would take that information and I would honestly tailor it per project. There may be projects where it's more important to you to have a little bit of extra headroom up top than it is to have uh, information in the bottom or vice versa. And that's gonna change where you set that middle exposure when you are capturing. Um, all things being equal, without uh, doing any of that testing, which uh, I, I don't think there's a great substitute for, I would definitely uh, go with, uh, you know, just shooting neutral dead middle exposure and then marrying that to a good color management pipeline that is preserving your middle gray all the way through to output. But that would be kind of how I would think about that is I would really think about how can I structure tests that give me hard data to answer the question that I'm asking for and enjoy that process and enjoy the fact that when we're working with uh, motion imaging and with capture and reproduction and image mastering, one way that you know that you're asking a good question is it leads you to more questions. Uh, so that's a, a, certainly the case here. You're asking a good question and it leads to more questions. It's something that can frustrate us if we let it, but it's something that we can also find immensely pleasurable if we let it. I heard a great quote recently that I'm probably going to botch a little bit, but something to the effect of, you know, as the area of our knowledge grows, so does the perimeter of our ignorance, meaning that the more we learn and the more we seek to learn, the greater that outer edge of new knowledge that we've yet to acquire becomes. So it's something that I long ago resigned myself to and really have learned to love and enjoy. And it goes back to my overall philosophy with grading of enjoying that process and maintaining a process oriented mindset. Like whether we're grading something or whether you are trying to figure out where to optimally set your exposure on your camera. Yeah, of course you want the best result. You want a clear answer. You want to get uh, the, the results that you're seeking, but it's also an immensely pleasurable process in and of itself if you allow it to be. Long answer, hopefully helpful. The next one. If I film all my footage with a single camera, is there any advantage to going from S-Log3 to ACES CCT grading Rec. 709? Or should I just keep transforming into ACES CCT and just grade the log footage before feeding it into a 709 ACES CCT? Yeah, awesome question. I think Jordan might win the uh, award this week or at least be in the, the top three for uh, really, really good questions. I mean, that's a great one to ask. And there's a couple different ways to answer it. 
The short practical answer would be, is there any difference in terms of what is possible or what I will achieve by mastering in S Gamut 3, S Log 3, uh, and uh, transforming directly from there to Rec 709 via an ACES pipeline, or versus first transcoding, or excuse me, transforming into ACES CCT and doing my grade in there. Is there a tangible, like visual difference, or will that change the way that my grade really feels as I'm going through it? No, not really. You could do one or the other. A couple of other thoughts beyond that, though, that are worth considering. The first is that if you are working with mixed formats at all, of course, that would change the equation. And the other one for me is if you are ever working with more than one source across projects. So even if your project at hand today is all S-Log3, all from one camera, there's not really necessarily an advantage to moving into a unified working space. But what if tomorrow you decide to go out and buy an Alexa or you, 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 you find uh, a, a red dragon uh, like lying on the street and you go, hey, free dragon, it's my lucky day. And you start shooting with that tomorrow. And like me, you've got a, a penchant for obsessing over looks and tools and image science. And you have all these tools that you've now developed for your S-Log3 working space. You may have a trickier time input mapping into S-Log3 than you would with a working space that's really designed to receive a bunch of different color spaces, like something like ACES CCT. So uh, the practical ground level answer is no, there's no real advantage or disadvantage to grading directly in your source color space, but there are some interesting long-term uh, and even short-term advantages to mapping everything into a unified uh, space uh, for those reasons. Next question. If I want to start outputting HDR footage, I believe this is REC 2020, do I need a special monitor to do so? If so, would a HDR TV suffice? Is this just a matter of changing my output node from REC 709 to REC 2020? Does filming in HLG change your ACES workflow much? Yeah, great question. So, you know, again, kind of a couple different ways to answer it, but if we look at things super practically, like let's, let me just reset my whole output transform for now. And let's just audition two different versions of uh, a similar idea. So I'm gonna do a really quick, dirty, uh, color management pipeline using ACES because it's really simple. So we're gonna do ACES, and this is, uh, I think for the most part, all Alexa in my timeline here, certainly the shot that I'm on is Alexa. So we're gonna do my front end input mapping, Alexa to ACES CCT, and then we'll do our output mapping from ACES CCT into Rec 709. Now, the fun sort of like short answer to the question of like, is outputting an HDR master as simple as flipping this output? Yeah, yeah it is. You can literally flip that output transform and you will get a technically accurate reproduction of the image that you mastered for SDR. That doesn't mean it will be one-to-one -one and that you wouldn't ever wanna make any creative adjustment to account for the difference in the feel of that display, but you will get a technically faithful reproduction simply by doing that. So that's kind of answer number one. Answer number two, if you actually want to master for HDR, just like with SDR, you need to be working on a calibrated reference display that has been calibrated to a particular spec. And in HDR, it's a much broader range of potential specs than we have with SDR. SDR, thankfully, these days is SDR. It's Rec. 709, it's 100 nit. It's a little bit of variance in the gamma curve depending on who you ask and what you're mastering for, whether that's web and brightly lit environments or more like a cinematic, like home theater vibe. Uh, but generally, it's the same tone curve with minor variations. HDR, the story is a little bit different. Do you want 1,000 nit? Do you want 300 nit? Do you want 10,000? Or you can't really master for 10,000 nit, but you, there are these different peak, luma, uh, peak luminance uh, levels that we can target. And there are also different tone curves and different gamuts that we can target, including things like P3D65 or Rec2020 or uh, on, the, on the tone curve side, ST2084 or uh, different things like that. But if we you know, like look at some of those options here in ACES, I could, for example, target REC 2020 ST2084. And if I had a display capable of reproducing that spec, I would see this image as it was intended to be seen on a high dynamic range display. Now, interestingly, specifically to talk about REC 2020, since you asked about it and since that's what I just chose here, there is no display that can reproduce 100% of REC 2020. 
And if we can't reproduce 100% of the gamut, we don't really want to master in it. So there's this weird sort of uh, convention that has arisen in the HDR world of mastering Rec 2020 limited to P3D65, but that's really more or less a way of saying P3D65 because there's, to my, uh, in my opinion, there's very limited utility to mastering for a color gamut that you're not seeing fully reproduced because uh, you're, 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 you're partially blind. So probably a better option here or a more likely one in terms of targeting a display that we currently have a, have uh, targeting display that we, we can actually reproduce the characteristics of. We could do Rec 2020 P3D65 Limited, as I said, or we could do something like P3D65 ST2084 and for this, something like a Sony X300 could reproduce 100% of this tone curve and this color gamut. So kind of two answers there. To me, the fun part about color management is, yeah, in a pinch, if you need an HDR master and you're, you've been told exactly the tone curve and the gamut that, that that master needs to adhere to, if you've been mastering color managed and you've been working in a space bigger than that display space, it really is fundamentally just a matter of flipping a switch. Now, mastering in a way that you can monitor uh, for that display space is a question, as with SDR, of having a properly calibrated monitor that allows you to see a faithful reproduction of that color gamut and tone curve. Next question. How can we map unsupported source, source color spaces into ACES? Great. Yeah, so this was one that, that uh, I kind of dog-eared uh, for myself because I've heard it asked in a couple different forms. But the fundamental idea here is like, all right, we've, we, we've just finished our big ACES series and hopefully a lot of us have uh, been exposed newly to the joys of working color managed and with ACES being you know, our first sort of dive into those waters. And the question is now, let's say, let me just change my, set my output transform back to Rec. 709 here on the output side for my little ACES workflow that I'm building. And let's say that this shot here is not Alexa at all. Let's say that uh, it is actually some other format, which I'm uh, very disappointed to find, I don't see present in the ACES transform list. So there's a couple different options, couple different uh, uh, you know, sort of courses of action we can undertake at that point. And we're like, hey, I want to work in ACES and I've got this source. I know what the source is, but it doesn't actually show up in the input transforms here inside Alexa. It's a question of needing essentially our own IDT or input device transform uh, in the, the ACES parlance. And ACES is revising itself constantly. So new IDTs do appear from time to time. So we can, of course, choose to wait it out and be patient. But this is where understanding the concepts of color management as I tried to convey them to you guys in the ACES Explained series really pays off because color management is color management and ACES is simply an example of color management and there is nothing sacred about an ACES IDT. They're generally pretty good. They're generally uh, of good pedigree because the data that was used to characterize the device that we are input transforming typically came directly from that manufacturer, so we can, uh, to hopefully a large extent, trust that it's accurate. Um, but there's nothing sacred about it per se. So one potential solution we can undertake if we want to continue to work in ACES and not move on to uh, another color management solution like Resolve Color Management, which we are going to get into in a uh, future series, we can mix and match the way that we color manage things, uh, in, 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 and there's no problem with doing that. So let's say, for example, I'm trying to think, like, I think Panasonic might be a good example. Like, I don't think uh, Panasonic, oh, V35 here, I forget the spec that that supports. Maybe that is V-Log. Um, but let's just say, for the sake of argument, we've got an input device and it is not supported in uh, the ACES ecosystem as of yet as an input transform. So one thing I might do is forego an ACES input transform and instead, do a color space transform inside of Resolve. Because Resolve is set up, it has this tool available to us for scratching the same itch that I'm talking about. Yes, it uses different math. Yes, there's some different sort of uh, presumptions and underlying image science, but it is no more or less sound than the ACES image science. It is just different. But you're not gonna see a perceptually inferior or superior result necessarily. If I were to do 
uh, you know, like I could, as a, a first initial example, I could mimic uh, an ARI to ACES input mapping that I would get with my ACES transform here inside of a color space transform. And this would be kind of the simplest possible version of that where I'm foregoing the extra options and simply input mapping. Now, you, I wouldn't put a gun to my head and swear every single pixel in this version of an ARI log C to ACES CCT mapping is going to match what I would see with the uh, ACES transform. But what I would say is both are technically sound and colorimetrically accurate. So we can use both uh, without fear that we are uh, making an inferior or uh, superior choice with one or the other. They both work. And where this really comes into play, of course, is when we have an input color space available to us here that's not available in ACES, and there's plenty of those. So that would be kind of my first go-to if I find that I have an input color space which is not supported in ACES, I would see if I can't get into ACES CCT by using a color space transform and seeing if that uh, source color space is supported by the color space transform, uh, even though it's not supported by ACES. So that would be option number one. And then you can go further with that, guys. Like th this is something I have for a, a couple of different uh, source color spaces that I can think of where you actually can go in and program like any good color space, any published color space, there's gonna be math floating out there from the manufacturer that say, hey, this is the relationship of our tone curve to linear. This is how you encode and decode our tone curve back to linear. And these are the primaries for uh, our color gamut as they relate back to a master color gamut uh, like CIE 1931, which by the way, uh, that horseshoe that I uh, demonstrated for you guys in ACES Explained Part 1 shows the full spectrum of human vision. That is the CIE XYZ color gamut. So it's a question, even if we don't have a tool that can ready-made do it for us, we can become amateur image scientists and say, all right, let's find the math to get me into a known color space and tone curve such as XYZ linear and map into it from there and then from there into ACES CCT. So, the solutions get more complicated, but if it's a published standard and the information and the math is out there, there's a way to skin it. It's just a question of how manual and mathy and code oriented we're going to have to get in order to solve the problem. The next one comes from Sofo. If you get iPhone footage shot in Filmic Pro log V3 10 bits, which input transform will you choose? Does it make sense to go from there to ACES, CCT, and then back to 709? Yeah, so good question. So I, I think the first part of that, uh, we had the chance to answer last week when we were talking about the benefits of input mapping Rec 709 material into ACES, even if it's ultimately just going back to Rec 709. So I'd encourage you guys to check that uh, episode out if you're interested in hearing that portion of the answer. In terms of the Filmic Pro thing specifically, I actually had the chance to uh, look into this quite briefly and uh, actually teeing off of what we just talked about, looking for the published math. The published math is incomplete and a little fuzzy on that question. So there is no, that to my knowledge, there does not seem to be a very good opportunity to create a technically accurate transform from that encoding gamut and encoding tone curve into ACES CCT. So absent that, what I would probably do is use one of the LUTs that Filmic Pro does publish that moves things back into Rec. 709, and then I would choose Rec. 709 as my IDT in the case of something like ACES. Now, you might argue that that's getting rid of the exact dynamic range that I wanted to have in the first place. So that's where workflow testing and pipeline testing come into play to see if that's actually true. And you may find that maybe it's better to go full manual and uh, just go display referred and uh, you know, play, work with your image that way if you really do feel like you're getting extra latitude out of the deal, even at the expense of not being able to color manage anymore. That's always an option to you. It wouldn't be my first choice, but uh, certainly something else you could do. Uh, Raphael, I'm curious, how are we looking uh, in the chat? Anything coming up in there that uh, is piggybacking onto any of the questions in our, our list or anything that, that sounds particularly juicy? Mm, this uh, four questions at this moment. I can read the first one if you want. Let's hear it. Uh, on that note of film emulation, how do you go about using film LUTs from Resolve, but in an ACES workflow? Does Simeon log transform have to happen? Yeah, really good question. And th there's, 
I can give you guys some practical uh, sort of examples here in a moment of like how I go about doing that because that's something I've done a ton of and, and spent a lot of time playing with. But there's a fundamental challenge hiding in there that there is ultimately no way around. Any legacy film line that you're going to look at was modeled in an SDR paradigm because ultimately film on the print side, on the reproduction side, is an SDR format. It doesn't go above, uh, you know, like depending on how it's being projected and how much light you're punching through the, the printed uh, film, you're talking about a 48 nit projection for a theater and we can get a reasonable 100 nit, uh, you know, like extrapolation of that for reproducing SDR. But when we are working in ACES in a color managed workflow of any sort, one of the benefits is we've got this big wide dynamic range available to us so the problem is we don't have a roadmap even it doesn't matter what film emulation we're looking with there is no roadmap that tells us what to do between 100 and 10,000 nits and thankfully that's not as much of the story as it sounds like because everything above 100 uh, is far less important than what happens at 100 or below even in an hdr model but the fundamental truth remains that we have to make some guesses and some judgment calls and some creative decisions about okay, what do I do when I'm a film, if I'm a film print emulation, I'm basically taking input pixels and characterizing and sculpting them into uh, a response that I might have gotten out of print film, married to, uh, you know, of, of, print, uh, of film negative uh, uh, printed to uh, film print. Uh, but since there is no such thing as anything really above 100 nits for a film print uh, for that model, we have to make some educated guesses. And we can do a pretty good job of that, but the fundamental truth remains that there is no model uh, above 100 nits for how to deal with that stuff. But fundamentally, like this is a really gross oversimplification, but it, it's I, I can quickly demo it out for you guys kind of as a starting point. Like, let's just play around with this. I've got my output transform here in my ACES pipeline, and I'm gonna go uh, and create an input transform, um, an ACES transform that is. Oh, I'm sorry, let me get my face out of the mix for you guys here. There we go. So now you can see my screen. I've got my output transform here, and we're going to do an input transform from Rec 709 into ACES CCT. And we're kind of working backwards, so this is going to look nuts for a while. Next, I'm going to take this input material and let's do a color space transform. We're going to need to for this. I need to, I'm about to pull up one of Resolve's film print LUTs, which uh, confusingly, like, it, it's, it's, not, it, it's not made super clear anywhere in Resolve documentation that, that I'm aware of anyway, that what we need to feed those LUTs is Cineon Rec 709. So I'm actually going to go from Area Alexa, and we're going to go to Rec 709, and we're going to go to Cineon, just doing a color space transform so that I can feed that LUT what it expects, because as you guys uh, may know, LUTs are very picky about their diet. We have to feed them exactly what they want, and we don't get to choose what they give back. It's just, it is what it is. We can adapt them, which is fundamentally what we're doing now. So I've now teed up this image here at this point in my node tree for one of those uh, Resolve film print LUTs. And if I go into my film prints, film looks subfolder here, and let's pick out uh, good old faithful Rec. 709 uh, 2383 D60. And this just means that it's going to take a Cineon input and kick, give it back to me in Rec. 709. And I'm going to now apply this to this image. So at this point in my node tree, following this uh, application of this LUT, I'm in Rec. 709, right? And all I'm doing downstream is I'm now taking that Rec. 709 and exploding it back out into ACES CCT before ultimately transforming it back to Rec. 709. So that's kind of a few steps to the puzzle, but if I go full screen here and I turn this off and then on, you can see uh, the result. And actually, let me do this even better. I'm gonna leave the final output transform on so that we can see just the effect of the film print. Let's see here. Uh, let me do this like this. Let me type one sec here, guys. I'm going to stick that output transform at the timeline level so I can leave that on and delete this. And now we can see 
you know, like one example of the idea of transforming from, of, of adequately transforming a rec, an area log C input into uh, rec 709, applying a Cineon to 709 LUT, and then taking that 709 image and exploding it back out to ACES CCT. So there's a lot of different variations that you can do within that theme, but that's one sort of simplified example of how we might map a legacy film print Rec. 709 LUT into a larger log uh, working color space. Uh, do you want me to ask another question from this stream or from the previous one? Dealer's choice. If, you, if we've got some more good ones in the stream, let's hit those. Let's ask this one from Jordan Ledbetter. Jordan Ledbetter. Some other YouTubers show tips on how to unlock the right hand side of the graph of the HDR controls in Resolve 17. Is this pointless given my inability to create HDR footage without properly equip equipment? Uh, so the, 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 the question is whether the high dynamic range tool has utility beyond mastering for HDRs. Am I getting that right? Do you think, Raphael? Mm. Can you repeat, please? The audio is cracking a little bit. Yeah. So, is is the question uh, whether I am uh, w whether there is use for the high dynamic range tool, even if I'm not mastering for HDR? Uh, I think it comes from more from the topic of how can I do HDR without the HDR equipment? I see. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 So. It's a good question. This is one of the areas where like, I think terminology gets really confusing. Here's the short answer. The high dynamic range palette is kind of a dumb name. It has nothing to do with high dynamic range in the sense of mastering of, of your final output. What it has to do with is that it is giving you access to more, more articulate access to the various tonal regions of your image even when it itself is in a high dynamic range state. So let's like kind of go back to zero. I'm going to stick an output transform. Oh good, well, we already have one here. So let's get an input transform uh, here on my, uh... oh, you know what? Everyone hang tight one second. I just realized I, made a slight boo-boo in the demo I was just doing, which I'm going to circle back to in a moment. I don't want to save my node tree there so that I can fix it. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a moment. However, back on this side, like here's a good example of an image that I am, let me set up the front end of my color management. So I'm coming in from Alexa, going into ACES CCT. I'm going to do all my grading in the middle here, right? My high dynamic range tool is still an awesome tool, even though I'm ultimately just delivering for uh, SDR, and I don't have an HDR monitor here in my home right now, um, it still has all kinds of utility in the sense that it allows me to access more discrete tonal ranges of my image than when I'm working with my traditional lift gamma and gain. I love these tools, they work great, uh, but the HDR tool is simply a different way of targeting narrower bands of uh, my, my tonal range in my image. So. It's a confusing name, but the very short answer to the question is there's absolutely use for this tool in all kinds of workflows, and it really has nothing to do with whether or not you are mastering on an HDR monitor. It has to do with the state of your image at the point you are grading it. So even though I'm going to SDR, I'm absolutely working on a high dynamic range image at this point in my node graph, which is what I always, I always want to be working on a high dynamic range state, regardless of whether I have to squish it into a little Rec. 709 container or I'm mastering for a bigger container uh, like HDR. And uh, while we get another question ready, let me just quickly tweak my last demonstration because my I was wiping my input transform on and off as well, and that was why I was getting my uh, I was getting incorrect results. So let's audition two versions of this image here. So we're doing our Alexa, 
Stuff gets complicated fast, guys. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to, for a second version, wipe these out. And we're going to do Alexa. So this would be a more neutral comparison of just plain old Alexa input mapping compared to uh, the REC 709 LUT adapted for ACES. So with here, it, we're really just seeing kind of more of a, of a push in the highlights and a little bit more overall contrast. And you could audition the same idea on other images and get uh, maybe a, a, a more dramatic uh, example. If we do that here versus there, yeah, so you can see there's our kind of film print version and there's our just straight up ACES mapped version. So just wanted to uh, zip that up because I realized I was slightly incorrectly demoing it a moment ago. Um, okay, what's next? From Hornet Melon Productions, I'm noticing that display manufacturers are talking up their P3 displays, while most tutorials assume RX709. In this case, transforming from ACCCT to RX709 in the timeline node. Is there any benefit to taking advantage of the wider P3 color space your display is capable of? And if so, how will you go about it? Great, yeah, another, another good question. Let me uh, make an adjustment here. So uh, I'll, I'm just gonna briefly answer that because we touched on a good portion of that a moment ago when uh, we were answering Jordan's question about uh, mastering for HDR. It really comes down to that same question of like, yeah, absolutely. If you've got a display that can reproduce 100% of P3 and it's been accurately calibrated and proven by uh, measurements to be able to do so, hell yeah. Bigger color gamut, bigger canvas, that's better. Um, that's a lot harder than it sounds because manufacturers love to say, oh, it hits P3. And if you read the fine print, it says, oh, it hits 93% of P3 or it hits 95% of P3 or 97% of P3. That does me no good because I don't know what 3% or 5% or 7% I'm missing. So unless a display can hit 100% of the gamut and tone curve that I want to master in, I'm better off going down, even if it's to a smaller tone curve and gamut, I'm better off going to one that it can 100% hit. So pays, that's where it pays, pays to read the fine print with that display. And also where there's no substitute for getting uh, a uh, calibrator in to measure the actual performance of that display and confirm that it is uh, accurately reproducing the standard that it claims because that's almost never the case, at least with consumer devices. Let's hit uh, some some more from uh, the, the, the chat. Okay. Uh, this one comes from Amandi Vitakani. Can we use a grown, a grown input core space if it gives us a good result? result? Very good question. Uh, the, the, and and I, I apologize, guys. I'm not sure if you all have been able to hear Raphael super well. We, we were trying to sort out our audio. We'll get it right for the next time. But if you didn't hear the question, uh, the, it, it was, can we use a wrong input color space transform that doesn't match our source material if it gives us a good creative result? Uh, the answer is yes. The color science police won't arrest you for it. I won't come to your house and... and beat you up or anything, but I wouldn't do that. I definitely wouldn't do that. The main reason being, we want to keep separate buckets when we're grading, you know, really color grading in 2021, we're kind of absorbing two jobs, what used to be two jobs. We are both the lab guy and the color timer. If we go back to the legacy model of image mastering, which has dominated most of uh, like cinematic image mastering for most of uh, its history, so we have a lab guy who does the technical processing and choices that are really not up to him other than a couple of mandates that might come from reduction, like let's pull that a stop or let's push that a stop. But the, the lab guy's not guessing. The lab guy's not saying, this looks like it should go in this bath for about this amount of time. And then this feels about like we, it's been in there long enough. Let's go over here and give that a try. He's adhering to very, very specific standards in order to get reliable, consistent, accurate results out of that process. And let's not even get into all the extra variables that come into play when you are processing uh, photochemical material. There's all kinds of unwanted variants just due to the fact that it's organic analog material. But as an analogy, we, want, we, we in 2021 are both the lab guy and the color timer. We're an artist and we're an engineer. 
And we don't want to put either guy in the other guy's shoes. I don't want the color timer coming in and telling my lab guys how to do their job. And I don't want my lab guys coming in and telling uh, the color timer how to do their job. So even though both of those guys are just me, you really, it pays to partition them and think of them in different buckets and get sound, accurate color management uh, in place as a foundation. And if there's something that you like and you even like you took inspiration because you flipped a switch wrong in your color space transform and you go, oh, wait a minute, that's kind of interesting. What I would do, if anything, is grab a still of that and use it as a reference and then grade to it using the proper tools. Instead of technical transforms, grade to it using the tools that were designed to give you creative manipulation of that image. Kedali Guberek asks, I've heard some colorists do corrections first, then apply the look. Others apply corrections under a look. What is the value of each approach and which one do you prefer? Great question. Uh, so the, 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 I'll, I'll try to remember to repeat these for you guys just in case you can't hear them so well. The question is, is it better to start kind of at the clip correction level and work our way out to the look and the overall, uh, you know, like sort of umbrella of the consistent uh, color management type operations across the entire timeline or vice versa? And uh, there's different ways to think about that. I will tell you the way that I think about it. Again, I, I kind of go back to, if we look at the history of, of the craft of color timing, which as you guys hopefully know by now, that's the tradition that I want to belong to. I care about cinematic images. That's the, those are the images that I am, have fallen in love with uh, so many times over my life. And I don't really care about the color correction, video engineer tradition of things. So everything that I do borrows from that tradition and if we look at that tradition prior to digital intermediate, which is very recent in the grand scheme of things, the way that everything worked in uh, that legacy model is we start at the macro and we slowly work our way down. So if we think about shooting film negative and then printing to film, uh, filmmakers, usually before the film was ever shot, before they rolled the frame, they would pick their print stock because they know the print stock is what's going to give them their creative contrast curve, the colorimetry, the split toning, all of like the mojo that creatively is gonna uh, be imbued by the image mastering process onto their frames. If before we got into digital intermediate, that was pretty much all gonna come from the film print. The color timer really didn't have tools at his or her disposal to do that with the, with the exception of like, yeah, sure, we can take like an image that was shot balanced like 5600K film uh, with a 5600K source and I can pump a bunch of blue in there and, and give it like a cool look. But those, that's kind of the extent of the creative tools that the color timer had available to him or her. And a lot of the look was really driven by the selection of a print stock, which is the most macro that we can think about the look or the process of mastering our image uh, is that sort of film print. So. The analog for that in 2021 is a combination of good color management followed by the selection of or the creation of a creative look or what you'll sometimes hear me refer to as a digital print stock. So I always, always, always like to start broad. I like to think of myself in that color timing tradition and say like, hey, let's pick your print stock. Where do you want your black point to sit? How deep the shadows? How pingy the highlights? How much color? How little color? How cool? How warm? Hot exposure, underexposure, middle exposure, big, wide, uh, separated color palette, or like very uh, neutral sort of like homogenous color palette. All of those top level questions, I like to ask and answer at the film, at the project level, as much as possible and cook as many of those decisions as possible into the overall look. And then from there, we'll slowly work our way down. And I want, I want adjusting clips, correcting clips, if you will, to be the very last thing that I do, and I want to do an absolute minimum of it, because my hope is that if I'm working with good collaborators who gathered their images well, and who, like me, love the look that we built up until this point, and love where that look is putting all those variables that I just outlined, that by the time we get to the clip level, I want to have as little to do as possible. I want to be bored at the clip level. I want to go, okay, let's trim a third of a stop there, cool. Uh, let's go 100 degrees warmer. Okay, cool. Uh, let's window the you know fill side of the subject's face a little bit. Okay, cool. I want to do clip level work as little as possible and do everything as much as I can uh, at the macro level. Jordan Lepetro asks, 
At future grade schools, do you think there's a room for a segment in which you give tips on grading user submissions? That's a very interesting idea. Uh, Jordan's question was whether we, we might incorporate uh, offering some feedback on, uh, on viewer submissions of, of the grades you guys are working on. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, Jordan. I'm going to chew on that, and maybe that is something we can incorporate in the future. Uh, dealer's choice, Raphael. If you've got some more uh, ripe ones in the chat, that's great. If not, uh, there might be uh, one or two more that we haven't yet addressed from uh, our, our, our list from uh, uh, questions asked in the, in the comments this week. Okay, let's go from the last one from the last week from Manuel Porzci. What, what, uh, what I was wondering about was you mentioned another solution to adjusting skin tones rather than qualifying it. As I never qualify a skin either, I will be interested to hear your approach on it if you're willing to share. Okay, awesome. So Manuel's question was about the way that we deal and the way we choose not to deal with skin tone and with slotting that exactly where we creatively want to see it go. I thought this was a great question because it's something that I feel like YouTube and uh, you know, like the chatter in filmmaking and color grading in general is sort of fixated on, like how to nail your skin tones and get the perfect skin tone. And I talked a little bit about this in my skin tone secrets uh, video, but I, I thought it was worth uh, sort of revisiting today. I'm gonna address this again, like in this kind of broad method and I'll address it with an analogy. Like, uh, let me show you one of the very first secondaries I was ever shown and one of the most like, like recurring secondaries that I was exposed to early in my career as a colorist, working with clients and also working with other colorists of like, you know, like let's take a shot like this one. Let's get that a little bit bigger. Like, hey, I feel like we could make our subject pop a little bit more, don't you? So we draw a little power window, right? We get some nice soft edges and we go in to our primaries and we pump her up a little bit. Maybe that's a little far. But, you know, like something like that. We've probably all seen or made that adjustment before, right? I, I know like that it's one of the most common flavors of adjustment that I see and that I get asked to make by clients. And I promise I'm coming back to skin tone, but this is to me a good sort of foundational exercise in, in talking about the skin tone thing. I do not like this approach whatsoever, and I'll tell you why. My question would be, in a shot like this, I know this is hypothetical because it's just a test image, but you're moving on right now to secondaries in your grade. That means you're telling me that as the colorist, you are happy with your primaries. You're happy with your baseline of, at a minimum, exposure, color temperature, and contrast ratio. That's what you're telling me uh, by choosing to go on to your secondaries. So my question would be, okay, you're happy with your primaries, and yet you don't like where the exposure is on your subject? What's more important in this frame than your subject? Why wouldn't you have that slotted exactly where it belongs? So the reason I have beef with this is because I would much sooner revisit my primaries. And if I want to see her a third of a stop up, let's move everything up a third of a stop, just like if I was lighting this on set. And if I then have the compulsion to shape things around her, like if I feel like the background is too hot, I'm much more inclined to do a circular power window where I take things away, where I sculpt the scene around her, as opposed to adding things with secondaries. It's something I'm generally very wary of. So by the time I'm, I'm moving on to my secondaries, I really want to be subtracting and sculpting, you know, like chipping away at my, 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 my Michelangelo's David, uh, if you will, and not adding more stuff uh, in the secondaries, if that makes sense. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I think very much the same concept applies with skin tone, where, okay, we've done our primaries, we've got it at a minimum, color temp, Kelvin, or excuse me, exposure, Kelvin, and contrast ratio. We're happy with those as a baseline, and we're ready to start getting more nitpicky about uh, our um, you know, secondaries and more fine-tuned, narrower adjustments. And a lot of the time, one of the first ones that comes up is skin tone. And my question there would be the exact same. You mean to tell me that the choices you made with your exposure and color temperature and contrast don't flatter your skin tone? What are you prioritizing if not the skin tone of your subject? It's the most important thing in any frame. Unless we're shooting nature documentaries, Human subjects and their skin are the most important thing in our frame. So we need to prioritize those, thing at, those things really at the expense of everything else. 
nail that skin tone, get that exposure, get that color temperature, whatever you can do in your primaries to correct it should be done there. Now, I understand there are instances where that's not enough. If I have skin tone that is not just suffering from, say, an image that's two points too green, we need to correct that, and once we correct it, the skin tone is going to feel more or less correct. There are instances where the hue itself is, uh, is off. But even there, I would apply my same metric that you guys hear me talk about so much. I'm looking for the broadest, simplest, cleanest solution possible, always. So in that scenario, let's say that creatively, even though I, I quite like where my skin tone is in this shot, let's say creatively it's all wrong for me and I want to make my subject look sickly, for example. I want to make her look unwell. I'm much more inclined to target that with a broader tool than the qualifier. The qualifier is about as narrow as we can get in Resolve, and for that reason, it's kind of my last choice. So I'll show you what I view as a good alternative to that. If I go to my curves here, and I go to my hue versus hue, I'm going to zoom in on my image, I drop her a nice broad range of her skin, and then I'm going to pull my vector scope back up, and I'm going to keep kind of one eye on the image, one eye on the vector scope, is I try to rotate her more kind of greeny with that skin, something like that. If we go full screen, we can see that go off and then on. So that's an example of the kind of secondary, more nuanced adjustment I would make if and only if I've done everything I can for my subject skin and for my creative goals for my subject skin with my primaries. And if I really feel like I've prioritized that properly and I just can't go any further and i got to get a little bit more still, I would be much more inclined to resort to the secondaries available to me here in my curves than uh, by doing something like a qualifier. So that's my, my, my skin tone and secondaries philosophy kind of in general. This question comes from Depender. Can we do something like texture equalizer from base light inside Resolve? Yeah, great question. Man, that tool, that was like all, all that I thought and talked about with my colorist buddies when uh, I first saw it demoed in Baseline. I was like, oh man, that's cool. Resolve actually released an answer to it in Resolve 17 called Texture Pop. I'm not positive it's quite as good, but it's pretty good. So let's zoom in on uh, Isabella here. And if I switch my operating mode to advanced, you can see I've got this sort of like octave model, just like in uh, uh, Baselight. Although I guess it's only seven uh, different uh, parameters where Baselight has eight, but it's the exact same premise. It's these different regions ranging from, or actually I guess it's six, because this is just my overall strength up here. But it's just these different regions ranging from very broad textures all the way up to really, really fine toothed uh, granular textures. So works, very similar to that base light tool. It's quite clearly a response to that base light tool and to all of the Resolve people saying, hey, Black Magic, you gotta give us this thing. This thing is so cool. So uh, that, that's, that, that, that's where that lives inside of Resolve. Do you use the color worker? Isn't it too similar to the various curves? Uh, I'm, uh, similar to what? To the various curves inside Resolve? Uh, oh, meaning, meaning like, versus. yes, 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 gotcha. Yeah, so good question. I, the, the question is, do I use the color warper and isn't it pretty similar to the hue versus hue or the other versus curves in Resolve? It is very similar. Uh, and I do use it though. Um, one thing that is potentially useful about the color warper is it's slightly more visual than the, uh, the hue versus curves. And it's especially useful if you wanted, for example, this is something that I've played around with. I wish I had a, I don't think I have a safe power grade of it handy. No, I don't. Um, if you wanted, for example, to reproduce what you guys have heard me describe in the past as the preferential color mapping of a film print, because film prints are a little bit tricky because they have such like this really strong, really beautiful, inky contrast for the most part. And that's kind of the thing that our eye recognizes most readily. Like if I go to my, let me just invoke one of my uh, print LUTs here, and let me go to some color management that I like a little bit better than ACES, like so. And yeah, go off and on here. So it's really tricky when we're looking at film prints because it's like, man, the thing that I notice 
by far the most readily is that like you know, like double shot of contrast that I'm getting out of the deal. It's really good contrast, but it's it's very prominent. It's the most noticeable thing. Film prints, however, have a second component that's just as uh, central to why we're still obsessed with them, uh, you know, like after a century of, of their use. And that's what I called in the past preferential color mapping, where they are taking colors like, you know, like look at my yellow here. This is being rotated less, less toward like a kind of greenish yellow and more toward like a goldy, slightly orange yellow. Like there's all of this sophisticated color remapping happening under the hood that for the most part is being done in accordance to all of the research that the Kodak guys did over the years to figure out like, gosh, how can we make images more pleasing, not to some people, not to people with this taste, but to everybody all the time. And it turns out that human beings have all kinds of very uh, eccentric preferences in terms of colors we like more and less. And things we expect, you know, you guys might be familiar with memory colors. Memory colors are colors we see often enough and that are important enough to us as human beings that we have sort of an internal stored ideal for them. And what's interesting, and, and examples of those would be like the three key ones would be skin, skies, and foliage. What's interesting is that that internal stored ideal does not actually match what an objective device measures when it captures those things under ideal conditions. So that's where preferential color mapping comes in. Part of its job, maybe the biggest part of its job, is to take what sky blue or you know, human skin actually photographs as and move it into what we like to see it as, what our memory color says about those hues. So that's a big part of what film prints do. That's uh, the other huge part of their magic. And it's a little tricky, again, to spot when we've got all this contrast going on. But to go back to the color warper, what I find interesting about it is if we wanted to do our own look that was comprised of, say, an overall contrast curve that we would implement manually, you know, like a, a strong, filmy, rolling S curve like this, and then we wanted to emulate that preferential color mapping component of a film print, the color warp was a great tool for that because we can sort of visualize and target the entire hue wheel and look at all right, so everything that's close to skin tone, you're going to get kind of squished into a more idealized skin tone. That region is also generally going to be pumped up in saturation because we like that. Uh, greens, like foliages, are going to get rotated away from the more yellowy green that they actually photograph as and into more of like a deep like forest green uh, that we tend to like more as our memory color for foliage or grass. So there's all these different kind of preferential things that uh, we can target really, really effectively and in a visual way and in a sort of one-stop comprehensive way using the color warper. And there is some, the, 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 the math and the color science underlying the color warper is fundamentally different than what we get out of our curves here. It's not necessarily better, uh, but it, it yields different. It's not just a different process or a different visualization. It is a different math that's going on under the hood, which uh, can be preferable in some situations. All right, we got time for, let's do like, like two more for today. If we have some. This one is from Amandi Vita. What other stuff do you think we should learn about besides what we face in the day to day? Colorimetry, video characteristics, film characteristics, camera specifications, cinematography, lighting. Yeah, sorry, I'm actually gonna uh, read that one in the chat just because it's it's wordy and I'm a, a, a visual guy uh, or actually if, if, if it was a second one let's see I don't see it uh, if, just uh, read it to me one more time uh, the one from Amanda Vita the what's all the stuff do you think we should learn about besides what we're facing the day to day Gotcha. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I got it now. What other stuff should we learn about besides what we face in the day to day? Colorimetry, video characteristics, film characteristics. Oh man, such a good question. And I, I would go back to that my my favorite quote of the week that I shared with you guys earlier about like as the area of our knowledge increases, so does the perimeter of our ignorance. Pick a direction, honestly. Like you can go. I've I've had so many uh, different alleyways that I've gone down over the years of like. Man, I really want to understand just as a uh, relevant example to some of the stuff we've talked about today, 
Like, I want to understand, like, what is so magical about film? Is it just a magical substance given to us by the gods? Like, why are we so obsessed with it? Why does it look so good? And you can go down that rabbit trail and find all kinds of information about why it looks the way it looks. Spoiler alert, it's not a magical substance. It's not something that we just stumbled onto. It's the result of a century's worth of very, very expensive research and development into human visual preferences. Um, so I'm trying to think of a really succinct answer that I could give there. I, I, I would, you know, if, 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 if I'm a good example to follow, I would sniff out the stuff that you're passionate about that you're like, oh, that's cool. I want to learn more about that and run it down and run it down as hard as you can and learn as much about it as you can. And the fun and the maddening part about it is you're only going to discover more questions and more missing knowledge that you're going to be that much more eager to fill in. So I, I wish I had a super like concise answer there, but you know, like on the practical side, practice, 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 play with images. You know, you guys, this, this resolve session that I share with you guys is a slight modification of a project that I have called workshop. That's exactly what it is. It's just me playing with images all day, every day. What does this do? What does that do? I want to make a tool that does this and see how that performs on images. Uh, so I, I experiment on images uh, in that way a lot. But, you know, like there's almost endless reading uh, to be done on these topics as well. And, you know, if you want to get super technical, there's technical ones out there. Uh, and if you want to find somewhere in between, there's that stuff too. Obviously, I can plug uh, uh, my, my guys at Mixing Light. Uh, I'm a contributor for them and there's Tons of good content on there, like thousands of videos on all kinds of topics um, that I, I think is generally of a more consistent, high quality than uh, you're likely to find on YouTube. So some uh, ideas on, on how to pursue and inflame your passion. Would we, would we be able to get into the same page with VFX artists if we use ACES transform OVX rather than ACES color management on project settings? Yeah, absolutely. The, it, the, the analogy that I would give with uh, node-based ACES transforms versus uh, doing it at the project settings level, it's identical. It's doing the exact same thing. It, it, it's just different. You're deploying it manually and using your knowledge of what the overall pipeline needs to be, um, excuse me, when you're using nodes, uh, whereas at the project level, it's generally kind of set up for you. But as long as you understand what you're doing uh, and, uh, you know, like figure out how to set up, how do I set up my my output transform? If my VFX vendor needs ACES linear, that means I'm going to need to flip my output transform to ACES linear uh, to furnish that for them or render, uh, you know, like flat pass or whatever the case may be. So it's just a question of workflow and understanding the concepts. But yes, there's the, the, the node-based uh, ACES color management system only affords more options. It doesn't confine or remove any options uh, from your uh, workflow. Uh, what the heck? Let's do one more. I guess we got a bit of a late start. If we have one. Format deliveries. Are there any steps in addition to changing the project's output color space? Yes, there are. The, 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 that is going to get you in a in a sound setup. That will get you, you know, let, like let's just take a hypothetical example. We uh, have uh, a project we're doing with multiple input camera spaces, and we've mapped all those into ACES CCT, and then mapped everything out to Rec. Seven or nine. We've mastered on a calibrated Rec. 7 or 9 monitor. We've gotten approval from our client. Everybody's happy. We're good to go. And now we need a 1,000-nit uh, HDR master. Let's use that as an example. The short answer is, yeah, the, the bulk of that is going to come from flipping that output transform to the proper setting that matches uh, that display. The next thing that there is no substitute for is we need to do what's called a trim pass uh, so that we actually can see what that image looks like on an HDR monitor. Because even with, you know, like we, 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 we will have fully or very close to technically accurate, perfect 
uh, reproduction of that SDR grade in HDR, but that doesn't mean it's going to be perceptually accurate. And that doesn't mean there's not going to be any compensations or adjustments needed based on how it feels to us as human beings, because our vision is not uh, an objective measurement device. It's incredibly uh, aberrant and uh, eccentric. So there's no substitute for doing that trim pass. And in fact, in this hypothetical I just gave, I would probably suggest the opposite, where we master that thousand nit version and then do an SDR trim pass. But regardless, that would be the other part of that process is you you can't really like if I'm your if I'm your colorist and you ask me for a thousand nit monitor and I don't happen to have a thousand nit monitor, I, I would say, hey, listen, we're going to have to rent a monitor because I can't in good faith just flip a switch and assume that it's all going to perfectly uh, track from SDR into HDR. I need to see that and be able to give you a trim pass and adjust things as needed. Um, well, guys, this has been uh, another uh, hour and change that has absolutely flown by. Awesome questions in the chat and awesome questions that I got uh, in feedback or, or comments from the videos this week. So I want to thank you all again for a, a really fun episode uh, of grade school. And let's thank Raphael as well for uh, helping to moderate and keep us uh, organized as we go along. So that'll wrap us up for this week. I'm going to try to do this again uh, next Friday. Same bat time, same bat channel. I'll always announce this on the community section of uh, my YouTube channel. And we may need to move things around if uh, scheduling conflicts arise. But I'm going to try to keep this as a regular thing for you guys because it seems like it's valuable to y'all. And I sure do enjoy getting to go a little bit deeper on this stuff than we uh, can really afford to do in uh, text-based comments. So thank you guys again. We'll see you uh, next week.